What does gender have to do with how much somebody earns? In many industries, women are still trailing behind their male colleagues in the 21st century. So why are some women still paid less than men? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. When Britain's public broadcaster, the BBC, revealed the names of its staff earning over $195,000, just five of the top 20 earners were women, three in the top 10. It's a theme echoed in workplaces across the world. But why? In the European Union, the average pay gap between men and women, it is reported, is 16%, about the same in the United States. What will it take to even it all up? It's a global problem affecting both East and West. The growing gap between what men and women earn. The highest paid sports stars. Hollywood's biggest earners. CEOs with the biggest salaries. And in our places of work. By some estimates, it could take 170 years to close the pay gap. Rights groups are calling on policymakers around the world to take action. But does unequal pay always mean unfair pay? There are around 1.75 billion women in work. But as the numbers rise, inequalities remain in pay and opportunity. Equal pay remains an elusive dream for numerous women. I think wherever you go um, across the globe, you hear the same thing from, from female entrepreneurs, which is that they have a unique challenge accessing capital. It is my belief that there is a greater understanding than ever that women need to be equal participants in our homes, in our societies, in our governments, and in our workplaces. If fighting for women's health care and paid family leave and equal pay is playing the woman card, then deal me in. Britain's BBC came under intense pressure when a list of top earners revealed just a third were women. The top seven were all men. In the world of politics, the gap is just as stark. Women earn 63 cents for every dollar made by a man in Donald Trump's White House. That's a pay gap of 37%, more than double the national average of 17%. Is the gender pay gap down to the pressures of our societies or simple discrimination? Engineering, finance and tech, lucrative industries dominated by men. Women are choosing other careers. Starting a family can be a major setback for career-driven women. Mothers earn less than non-mothers. Single women more than married women. And women of color earn 17% less than their white female colleagues. But there are signs of change. There's growing acceptance. Pay inequality is damaging to economic growth. Japan has closed its gender gap by 6.2% and wants to increase women in leadership positions to at least 30% by 2020. Since 2014, over 80% of Mexican companies have implemented work-life balance programs that include flexible working hours. Google has extended its family leave policy from three to five months. Meaningful steps and with more women in the workplace, the issue has been pushed up the political agenda. But if we're to believe the predictions on when that gap will be closed, it could be a very long time. At the round table today, well, not literally, out of Washington, D.C., first of all, we introduced Jenny Klugman, a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy's School for Women and Public Policy Program. She says greater transparency is needed to sort this out. Shaysta Aziz with me here in the studio, a journalist who specializes in gender issues, who says the pay gap is not just about gender, and we touched on it there, but about race and religion too. Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys, who thinks the gender pay gap divide is shaming men. 
into giving women more money. And Landry Akinola, editor of African Business, who says discrimination and inequality rising across the board. Mike, I'm going to come to you in just a moment because you have rumped your way through those reports. I saw steam coming out <laughs> of your ears. You will have your say in just a moment. But first to, to Jenny in Washington, D.C. In a report that you were part of, Jenny, called Chapter 4, Women's Economic Empowerment, uh, you said you have to tackle the root causes of all of this. So my first question to you is, is why are we in this position? Well, it is a paradox. We've seen enormous progress on many fronts for women and girls around the world in terms of education, more women graduating from university than men for several decades now, a whole host of legal protections in many countries around the world, but we still see these persistent gaps, uh, even in the US, the UK, uh, and around the world, including Australia, where I'm from. Sure, and but, when we but look to why? See the reason for those gaps uh, come down very much to social norms and attitudes. Social norms and attitudes held by both women as well as men, shaping the career choices, which sectors and jobs women go into, and the attitudes and cultures within those workplaces, which affect the career opportunities for women, for women uh, the pay that they receive, for the work that they do. Uh, I'm going to have to stop you there because we've got to, want to bring everybody else the in at the moment. We're back with you in a moment, unpaid Jenny. Work. Mm. Um, Mike, am I right in thinking you believe that uh, discrimination against women based on, on pay does not exist? Uh, I'm not saying it never exists, but it's not systemic and it's not, um, it's not widespread. And I would ask Jenny, um, the, the Office for National Statistics um, show that in... A UK organisation. A, a UK organisation. Yeah show that uh, between the ages of uh, 21 and 39, um, women on average, uh, both on the median earning, hourly earnings and mean hourly earnings, earn more than men. Now, um, should, should those women be paid less, Jenny, or should men be paid more in those age groups? Well, I think that's a rhetorical question, well, so we'll, we'll, we'll be, come back uh, to that in just a moment. Paid. Mike's just throwing it out there, Jenny. I want to bring the other panellists in. But could in. I just quickly just say on that one... Okay. The women are better educated than men. So women are coming out with college degrees at a much higher rate than men. And so one would expect fair pay based on educational achievements uh, would indeed accord women, young women, higher rates of pay. But then other constraints kick in which prevent their advancement in their careers and so they slip behind. Shasta, let me um, put to you something that Jenny mentioned earlier on. She said it's not just men's attitudes. Yeah, that's it's right. women's attitudes as well that are holding women back. Absolutely. So patriarchy isn't just the uh, domain of men. Women also hold women back as well. We see that quite frequently. Uh, you can nod your head as much as you want, but last time I checked, no. you're not a woman, and I am, so I have lived experience of being a woman. So, um, yes, it's not just about men versus women, just to be very clear. This is about structures. Uh, this gender pay gap is real. It's not a figment of Im women's imaginations. All the data out there shows that something is going on in terms of women not being paid properly in the way that they should for the work that they do. And it's to do with how society values women and the contribution that they make. So why, why are women paid more in their 20s and 30s on average than men? What the statistics show is in between the ages of 20 to 30, women are earning what they should be earning. It's when they start thinking about becoming mothers, having babies, uh, when their personal situations change, that the discrimination kicks in. It's not discrimination, it's women's choices. Women, women decide to, to uh, be less career focused. We, we, uh, Why do women uh, we, choose we, to be less we, career we focused? How Catherine, do you know we that? We know from Catherine Hackim, a world renowned sociologist. You'll get your chance, Larry. Right. We, 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 we know from Catherine How do you know women Hackim. are Sorry, less career focused? Speak. Please, please, please allow me to say this. So, Catherine, we know from Catherine Hackim in, in, in uh, a study she, uh, or a theory she called preference theory that while four in seven British men are work centred, only one in seven British women is. So it's not a question of discrimination, it's a question of, of women, uh, far more men being work-centred than women. Uh, so, so we would expect when, when, when women want to s settle down and have, and have families, um, are, you know, uh, in, in their 30s, that women but go... But I suppose the question is, mm. Mike, at this point, and let, let's bring in Lanry, um, the question is whether that is the case because women want it to be the case or because it's thrust upon them. Well, the, the assumption that's being made is that these choices are being made freely. And uh, the, I, would, I would slightly disagree with that and suggest that many inequalities in society are conditioned. They're conditioned by uh, environment, structures, they're conditioned by attitudes. 
Uh, you look at things like poverty. You look at things like um, you know uh, racial inequality. It's not always coincidental. In a perfect world, everyone would have free choice to do exactly what they want to do. But anyone who lives in the real world understands that that's not the case. That uh, depending on your circumstances, your choices are often very limited, and that um, depending on context will also apply to women. But women are making choices. They're not being forced to spend more time with you know they they want to, despite the you know the feminist narrative that that, that, that women are as work centered as men. Um, and, and they should hand over their over their babies to strangers to to uh, to, to, to look after, uh, not long after birth. Um, most most women want more balance in their lives. They, they do not want to be workhorses. What do you think, Chester, about, about Sue McGregor, one of the most respected, but now partially retired broadcasters in in Britain's history, uh, was on the morning programme for 20, 30 years. She says, and she said this after this report came out about the BBC. She says it ain't going to change until men have babies. Well, men do have babies. They are responsible for producing they babies. They don't have babies. No, you but, know exactly but what I mean. I do know what you mean. But the fact of the matter is that babies aren't just produced but by women. So I think that what, what I agree with what you just said, which is this is about the s structures that basically discriminate against women. And we need to fix those structures. We need to look at why women are being discriminated against. OK, let's bring in Jenny, because I know you wanted to say something. But can I come in on that one just to give a slightly different angle and talk about the, the benefits for men and for fathers for being more fully engaged in the, in the raising of their children. A number of countries now have not only parental leave but paternity leave which is non-transferable. And so that enables men to take more time with their children and it, when it's done at an early age it actually has uh, long-lasting effects. And there's good evidence that it raises um, the well-being of the fathers and the men as well as the overall family. So I think that the structures which have been mentioned are very important, but the structures can be changed in ways which help to affect uh, household behaviour. Okay, we, we are talking norms. about pay here, but uh, on the way that you've directed it there, uh, Jenny, let me just say there's another female columnist in Britain called Melanie Phillips who's written, men have been systemically feminized to the great disadvantage of their gender. So perhaps by changing things, we're not bringing equality just to women, we're bringing inequality to men. Do you want to start with that one, or is that for another day? Well, I'm not sure if I can directly answer that question. Well, but no, I think it's... Jenny, sorry, carry on. I think there's good benefits from, from greater involvement on the part of, of fathers. Uh, you know, my husband took a very large role in the raising of our two children, and I think we all benefited enormously from that. Um, so I think that we should look at ways in which changes can happen which enable women to have fruitful careers, men to have fruitful careers, but much more equitable sharing of work in the home. I think unpaid work in the home is a big part of the equation. Lanry, no, he, 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 bring you in and then come back to you, Mike. Um, so I was born in 1981, which technically makes me a millennial. I know I don't look it, but um, that puts me in a slightly different generation. For me, uh, one thing I've always struggled with is that this always boils down to it's a man versus woman issue. And I would suggest that that's part of, the, part of the difficulty here is it's always men versus women. You get this, we get that. I think this point around the family is really important. Um, a father is as important to a child as, as a mother in many ways, in some ways more important. Um, you made the point earlier that women want better work-life balance. I would argue many men would like better work-life balance if they had access to it um, for things like being able to pay more attention to your family, which many, many people struggle with, many men struggle with. We don't have the laws in place to facilitate that at the moment, but the point was made that these are choices. Laws can be changed. Systems can be changed. We don't have to work the hours we work. We don't have to work the days we work. We don't have to be limited to the time off that we can take off. Uh, for family. It's a matter of whether it's a choice or not. Yes. Like, I mean, and, and you, you, you admire the, the work of uh, William Collins. Men, yes, men, hugely. Men's rights blogger who says it takes decades of effort for men to get where they get, therefore they deserve it. The, 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 they deserve it because I go back to Catherine Hackin. Um, it's, you know, m men invest more in their careers and men's partners expect them to. There, there are few women that would, that, that, that would happily work so as to fund their, 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 their partners looking after children. You know, there is such a thing as maternal instinct, and feminism denies that. Feminism does not deny w women's instinct. Uh, instinct. I'm a woman, I don't have children, 
Does that mean I'm any less of a woman? No, it doesn't. Well, and when it comes to... No, but what's this business about women's instinct? Men also want to have babies. It's not just women who want to have babies. But going back to what you just said about, uh, you know, these structures, this is, there's a lot of cultural baggage here, and I completely agree with you about the men versus women narrative. This is not what this is about. It should be about uh, equality, and it should be in 2017, women should be recognised for the work they do and paid adequately and paid properly. William Collins, who I just mentioned, uh, Mike's a big fan of his, also says that uh, by bringing women up, to be equal with men in, in the conditions in which they enjoy their lives, and we're talking about pay here. We are risking social unrest in this country, in the United Kingdom. True? Yes. He does that's say that. No, 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 I'm not asking for a response, but he does say that. What do you think? I'd like to know how that's going to create social unrest. Yeah, and what bit, what's, exactly, what's the connection there? Uh, because female employment drives male unemployment, as, as, a, as a paper by Belinda Brown, an anthropologist, uh, demonstrated years ago. Men and women are different. Can I just make yeah, a couple of, of points on this one? Um, on the, I think that uh, women are increasingly the main breadwinners in a number of families, and part of this is due to economic restructuring. And as we discussed earlier, women and men tend to work in different types of sectors and jobs. Uh, so women in a number of countries are in growing sectors, and they are becoming the ma main breadwinners. And I think that opens a political opportunity uh, to address the low pay in those sectors. Uh, in the US, 60% of low, um, of minimum wage workers uh, are women, uh, and the minimum wages are very low. And so by raising minimum wages, um, not just on a gender basis, but because they're, they're overly low paid jobs, that will tend to close the, the gender wage gap. Um, so I think there, there are very large benefits for families that are struggling, which are very much dependent on wages of workers and the wages of workers in low-paid uh, sectors who overwhelmingly do tend to be women. What, women what? who are working part-time, getting very low hourly rates and no benefits. Because of supply oh. and demand. What, what, what do we all make of because this? Of exploitation. The fact that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, not uh, a subject we normally refer to <laughs> here, but it, it went for blind hiring. It didn't say, or it didn't even know whether the person was a man or a woman. And the new practices contributed to an immediate increase in the share of female senior executives up from, what would you think? You can see my notes, but what No, no, um, <laughs> I have no idea. 20 percent? It went up by 20 percent, from 21 percent to 41 percent. But blind hiring, is also, there was a later, uh, a larger Within study... Within just two years There was a later study which, well. showed, which showed that blind hiring, um, um, you know, it, there's just so many, so much contradictory stuff around here. The idea that you would, that you would hire somebody without even meeting them, I think is just, just insane. It's a test. Okay, I understand that. But I mean, what, what does it show to you? Well, it shows that there's a problem, doesn't it? So if you've got, if you, it means that there's prejudice in terms of hiring people. There's uh, assumptions made about who can and who can't do the job. Uh, when we talk about the gender pay gap, we should also need to talk about the issue of race. We need to talk about class. We need to talk about intersectionality. We've already heard about uh, who is earning the lowest wage. Mostly it's women, 60%. Your film shows that 17% of women of colour are being further discriminated against because they are non-white women. All these factors, again, take us back to structures and take us back to structural racism, structural issues in society that have been there for hundreds of years and that have never been you see, I think the point, if, if I can direct this back up, Mike, and back to, the, to the, the gender pay gap, that your point, more than anything else, is, is not so much about the financial side of things. It's about what you see as the emasculation of men as a result of this push towards um, e equality, if you like. Yes, well, equality, I mean, you know, w when feminists talk about equality, they mean gender privileging. So it's, it's, it's 30 years ago this year that um, in the UK, um, O-levels were replaced by GCSEs. Now, before that, there was no education gender gap. Uh, boys and girls did, did and, and young women and young men um, at O-levels and A-levels did, 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 did uh, um, um, very, very similarly well. But the whole point of introducing GCSEs was, was, was to bring in... Um, Continu continuous assessment to make it more subjective. And we know that both male and female teachers have an inbuilt bias towards uh, marking girls better than boys. I think they work uh, hard, I've got three daughters. Uh, but but, 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 but there's also that bias, and that bias, uh, again, another, there's a very good uh, paper by William Collins on this. Um, 
and, and, and in his paper, he showed that the gender education gap started in the 1987-8 This uh, is year. in the UK. And, and, and it, but it's been yeah. with us for 30 years. Okay, so and, and the Education Secretary takes no interest. Jenny, is there a gender bias now towards women, perhaps? I just wanted to mention on the, on the workplace bias that there is uh, both widespread evidence of its significance in terms of, especially in terms of discretionary decisions, so about uh, uh, career advancement, about pay. Uh, women tend not to be as forceful in terms of negotiations, and when they do, they're deemed aggressive and are penalised for that. I would just commend to Mike um, a book by my colleague, uh, Professor Iris Bonnet, called Gender by Design. And she looks at the, the structures and the practices within uh, the corporate world um, and other types of employers and changes that can be made that affect the decision-making environment in order to make it fairer and much more based on merit um, and therefore lead to more equitable outcomes. And so, for example, the blind uh, hiring is part of that. Um, it's not as though um, you don't have any information about the applicants and, in fact, the the attrition rates and the success of those applicants tends to be much higher, but you're taking out the subjective aspects, which mean that people tend to affiliate with people like them. And when people I, like them are those who are um, historically I'm bringing it back being to the table, from Jenny, certain if I classes may. and certain genders. Uh, uh, just, just simply to mm. ask those of you around here, I mean, we, we, we think there's a problem. We look on it as I, a different I, problem, I, perhaps. <laughs> Um, in, in different ways. But how do you think we can get past this? Thanks, well, first of all, by having these discussions, um, by bringing this out into the open, by actually looking at the evidence and looking at what's happening. Um, in order to change things, we need to be less defensive and we need to open up those boardrooms to have proper discussions. I think that's starting to happen, but it's not happening enough. Do you think men are taking an unfair rap, as Mike suggests? Look, and therefore it has to be looked at from both I sides? I don't think this has to be about men versus women. Okay. Okay? This needs to be about creating equity and it needs to be about treating people in a fair way. It's as simple as that. This is not man versus woman. I don't, I don't see myself being better than a man or anything like that. I, 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 I don't think men... What women are asking for is to be paid properly and to be treated with respect and be treated fairly. As simple as that. that. The, there is no gender pay gap problem, and therefore there's, there's no need for a solution. And I, I, I would recommend to, 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 to Jenny a book also, um, The Sexual Paradox by Susan Pinker, a psychologist, in which she, ex uh, she interviews plenty of women in, uh, you know, uh, in business, and, and they just you know, do not want to lead the kind of lives you know, they are not, you know, they're, they're, they're not workhorses in the way that men... So, 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 you know, as time comes on and they have children, they tend to want to step down. And, and, and put less I, effort into their careers. I, I think there's, there's an interesting phrase you use, they're not workhorses like men. And I would, I would put it to you that if it was a viable choice, a lot of men would also choose not to be workhorses. Now, I'm, I guess I'm one of those emasculated men that's been completely feminized by this wave of feminism, which um, I, don't feel, I don't feel any less as, uh, of, of an individual as a result of it. I would say if this is to be addressed, uh, it has to stop being uh, a binary issue. It has to stop being us versus them. Uh, you know, there is no enemy here. Society loses when inequalities get out of control. That is uh, the case whether it's uh, between men and women, whether it's between races, if you want to call it that, whether it's between social classes. Uh, there's, no, there's no argument against someone wanting to be treated the same for, you know, engaging in the same activity as anyone else. And I would say, it's as unfair for a woman to be paid less than a man as it is for a person of color, or however you want to look at but it, being paid less than someone else. There is no evidence that for doing the same job, women are paid less than men. None. I can hear the, the, the chorus <laughs> of howls from, from out there. Mike, thank you very much. Jenny Klugman, um, Australian, working in the United States. But let's take you back to Australia, uh, and not your home city, which is Sydney, but uh, Melbourne. And there was a story this week that there is a, a sister's bar, and I put that in quote, in Melbourne, cafe stroke restaurant stroke bar, where they are now charging men an 18% tax because they are men and they get paid more. <laughs> what do you make of that? I think it's a great reminder of, you know, the, the ways in which this pans out in practice. There are other practices, I think, in France where women uh, go on strike for one day a week or you know, because they're earning 20% less. 
And so I think ways of making the, the problem more transparent, and I think the, the advantage of the BBC study is just bringing these issues out in the open. And I think a lot more understanding and debate about the challenge, but also what the benefits can be for families, for communities, for societies and economies of greater equality, I think is a very important topic for discussion. I suppose the point is, and perhaps we all agree on this one, is, is the f just getting it out in the open, talking about it is, is a very good thing. And, and I do hope that during the course of the, this program, we've managed to give you, Jenny, um, in the US, 25% of the airtime, 25%, 25%. I'm happy to take a bit 25%, less. 25%. And I got, I, think about it, I got, I got absolutely nothing out of this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for joining thank us thank you. on Round Table. And Jenny, thank you in the United States. Very early in the morning. Appreciate you getting up. So it is male or female. Personal opinion shouldn't really matter at all. Like all inequality, though, the gender pay gap is going to take time and efforts and conversations, perhaps, to address it, if not to fix it. I saw the look I was getting from Mike as I was about to say fix. This has been Round Table from me, David Foster, and the team. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time, I hope. Bye-bye.